do 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 Hello, welcome to episode three of What They Saw. Today I'm going to be reading uh, General John B. Gordon's account of the Battle of Monocacy. As he recounted in his book, uh, Reminiscences, Reminiscences. Memories of the Civil War. Here we go. With the hope of creating some apprehension for the safety of the national capital, and thus inducing General Grant to slacken his hold on the Confederacy's throat, it was decided that we should again cross the Potomac and threaten Washington. The federal authorities sent the dashing soldier General Lew Wallace, who afterward became famous as the author of Ben-Hur, to meet us with his army at Monoxy River near Frederick City, Maryland, which is my hometown. His business was to check the rash southern invaders and, if possible, to drive them back across the Potomac. The Battle of Monocacy, which ensued, was short, decisive, and bloody. While the two armies under the command, respectively, of Lew Wallace and Jubal Early were contemplating each other from the opposite banks, my division was selected not to prevent Wallace from driving us out of Maryland, but to drive him from our front and thus reopen the highway for our march upon the capital. My movement was down the right bank of the Monocacy to a fording place below, the object being to cross the river and then turn upon the federal stronghold. My hope and effort were to conceal the movement from Wallace's watchful eye until my troops were over, and then apprise him of my presence on his side of the river by a sudden rush upon his left flank. But General McCausland's brigade of Confederate cavalry had already gallantly attacked a portion of his troops, and he discovered the maneuver of my division before it could drag itself through the water and up the Monocacy's muddy and slippery banks. He at once changed front and drew up his line in a strong position to meet the assault. This movement presented new difficulties. Instead of realizing my hope of finding the Union forces still facing Early's other division beyond the river, giving my isolated command the immense advantage of proposed flank attack, I found myself separated from all other Confederate infantry with the bristling front of Wallace's army before me. In addition to this trouble, I found difficulties before unknown which strongly militated against the probable success of my movement, Across the intervening fields through which we were to advance, there were strong farm fences, which my men must climb while under fire. Worse still, those fields were thickly studded with huge grain stacks, which the harvesters had recently piled. They were so broad and high and close together that no line of battle could possibly be maintained while advancing through them. Every intelligent private in my command, as he looked over the field, must have known before we started that my battle line would become tangled and confused in the attempt to charge through these obstructions. With an able commander in my front, and his compact rank so placed as to rake every foot of the field with their fire, with the certainty of having my lines broken and tangled by the fences and grain stacks at every rod of advance, it's not difficult to understand the responsibility of hazarding battle without supporting Confederate infantry in reach. The nerve of the best trained and bravest troops is sorely taxed, even under the most favorable conditions when insulting an enemy well-posted and pouring an incessant well-directed fire into their advancing ranks. To how much severe test of nerve were my troops to be subjected in this attempt to charge, where the conditions forced them while under fire to break into column, halt, and reform, and make another start only to be broken again by the immovable stacks all over the field. I knew, however that if any troops in the world could win victory against such adverse conditions, those high-mettled southern boys would achieve it. On echelon, by brigades from the right, the movement began. As we reached the first line of strong and high fencing, my man began to climb over it. They were met by a tempest of bullets, and many of the brave fellows fell at the first volley. But over they climbed, or tumbled and rushed forward, some of them halting to break down gaps in the fence so that the mounted officers might ride through. Then came the grain stacks. Around them and between them they pressed on with no possibility of maintaining orderly alignment or returning any effective fire. Deadly missiles from Wallace's ranks were cutting down the line and company officers with their words of cheer to the men, but half-spoken. 
It was one of those fights where success depends largely upon the prowess of the individual soldier. The men were deprived of that support and strength imparted by a compact line, where the elbow touch of comrade with comrade gives confidence to each and sends the electric thrill of enthusiasm through all. But nothing could deter them. Neither the obstructions nor the leaden blast in their front could check them. The supreme test of their marvelous nerve and self-control now came. They had passed the forest of malign wheat stacks. They had climbed the second fence, were in close proximity to Wallace's first line of battle, which stood firmly and was little hurt. The remaining officers on horseback and on foot rapidly adjusted their commands, and I ordered, Forward! And forward they went. I recall no charge of the war, except that of the 12th of May against Hancock, in which my brave fellows seemed so swayed by an enthusiasm which amounted almost to a martial delirium, and the swell of the southern yell rose high above the din of battle as they rushed upon the resolute Federals and hurled them back upon the second line. The Union line stood firmly in this second position, bravely defending the railroad and the highway to Washington. Between the two hostile lines there was a narrow ravine which ran a small stream of limpid water, in this ravine the fighting was desperate and at close quarters, and to and fro the battle swayed across the little stream, the dead and the wounded of both sides mingling their blood in its waters. And when the struggle was ended, a crimson current ran towards the river. Nearly one half of my men and a large number of Federals fell there. Many of my officers went down, and General Clement A. Evans, the trusted leader of my largest brigade, was severely wounded. A mini-ball struck him in his left side, passing through a pocket of his coat, and carrying with it a number of pins which were so deeply embedded that they were not all extracted for a number of years. But the execution of his orders was superintended by a staff officer, Major Eugene C. Gordon, who was himself severely wounded. In that vortex of fire, my favorite battle horse, presented to me by my generous comrades, which had never hitherto been wounded, was struck by a mini ball, and plunged and fell in the midst of my men carrying me down with him. Ordinarily, the killing of a horse in battle, though ridden by the commander, would scarcely be worth noting, but in this case it was serious. By his death I had been unhorsed in the very crisis of the battle. Many of my leading officers were killed or disabled. The chances for victory or defeat were at the moment so evenly balanced that a temporary halt or slight blunder might turn the scales. My staff were bearing orders to different portions of the field, but some thoughtful officer sent me a horse, and I was again mounted. Wallace's army, after the most stubborn resistance and heavy loss, was driven from the railroad and pike in the direction of Baltimore. The Confederate victory was won at a fearful cost, and by practically a single division. But it was complete, and the way to Washington was open for General Early's march. So this was Confederate General... Uh, John B. Gordon's account in his autobiography of the Battle of Monocacy. I appreciate you watching. See you soon.